All right. Uh, we're gonna see if this is working. I'm gonna try this one more time. No, I'm gonna email you. All right, so I'm gonna be doing a Quebec bridge collapse. Um, and my name is Jalil Span. So just going over a uh, narrative. Uh, so the background, uh, incident cause, aftermath, and then I'm gonna go over the ethics of the values, morals, and responsibility. So uh, the background incident took place in Quebec, Canada. Uh, the bridge was built over the St. Lawrence River. Uh, the bridge was proposed in the 19th century. Uh, the bridge is also a government project. They held a design competition kind of, uh, I guess, from around the world and just chose uh, uh, bridge companies to kind of just send, submit their own designs and engineers uh, for what they would select as the best bridge. Um, so I guess the government had hired uh, Theodore Cooper, who was an uh, engineer from New York, very good engineer, built buildings, or uh, I said a few buildings and designs in uh, New York that were pretty good. Uh, so him and uh, I guess whoever like the government had as like the head guy over at Conda at the time was uh, selected Phoenix Bridge Company design because uh, they said it, it was kind of cheap and easy, easy to build and fast. So that's kind of who they went with and they thought it was pretty solid design. Um, so the foundations for, oh, and then also uh, Phoenix Bridge Company was like one of the best bridge building company at the time in the world. So they also went with them because of that. Um, the foundations for the bridge was being installed between 1899 and 1903. Uh, the anchor span for the bridge weren't approved until, uh, were approved in 1904, and then they began installing them in the same year. Uh, construction began in 1905, where they kind of initially started building the trust and all that stuff for the bridge and setting it down. Um, <clears throat> So with the initial design of the bridge, it's supposed to be a 600 foot span, it was extended to 1800 feet, uh, which was changed by uh, Cooper um, because he said it would make the, uh, he actually did like the center truss of the bridge kind of expanding it uh, because it would just make it a uh, fast, easier design. Um, Cooper also changed like the wind load from uh, down from 50, 56 pounds per square foot to 30 pounds per square foot. Um, and then he also increased the stress load to 21,000 um, pounds per square inch and 24,000 pounds per square inch. And he did 21,000 is for the uh, set of E30, um, I guess, supports. And then like E50 supports was, could hold 24,000 uh, pounds per square inch. And usually, like the standard for a bridge is like sixteen thousand pounds per square inch. Um, so, with the bridge being eighteen, uh, eighteen hundred having an eighteen hundred foot span, it would be like the world's largest bridge when built, and it would surpass the uh, Firth of Fourth Bridge, which was uh, seventeen hundred and ten feet uh, foot span. And then the day of the bridge collapse was August 29th, 1907. Um, so this is kind of like the wind design by the Phoenix Bridge uh, design. So right here, kind of like in the middle is where like they expanded like the truss, I guess, and made it longer to just make it the 1800 foot. Because if you see right there, it says 1600 feet, kind of initial design. So that's kind of what they did. Um, so this is going into the incident and kind of what happened. The, the day of the bridge collapse. So a worker named Bavius was uh, driving rivets into the uh, southern span of the bridge. At the end of the day, he noticed that a river that he had just driven in like less under an hour ago uh, had snapped into two. Um, so as he called out to his foreman to like report it, uh, the, all you heard was like the metal just bending and twisting uh, going through the air and the bridge just collapsed from under, uh, underneath them. So crashing into the river with such force, uh, the people actually in Quebec, which is about 10 kilometers away, thought that an earthquake might have struck and didn't realize the bridge collapsed. Uh, also at the time, uh, the timekeeper, uh, Hoyt, I think I had pronounced it, who had uh, been just about the whistle, the workers at the end of the day to just tell them the day's over with, uh, felt the bridge actually collapsing under him and started running 
in panic and he eventually reached safety as a uh, it like finally snapped from under him or as it finally snapped before when he got to safety um so babies who went down with the bridge uh managed to get free and get himself out and he kind of left the scene with just only a broken leg uh also at the time a train engineer i guess was either on the train on the bridge or the driving pass uh when the bridge collapsed fell into the river too but uh he was able to uh get out safely when a, a rescue boat was in the water saving people um uh, a group of sightseers actually had just uh, walked through the bridge, and I guess we're like a little about a little bit away when they uh, could hear it uh, collapsing behind them, and they like and they kind of were scared because they were just on that bridge like a few minutes before. Uh, so on that day, there was 86 workers on the bridge, and out of the 86 workers, 75 died. Um, many of them from uh, Cognawaga, which is known for their famous steel work. So I guess they kind of got the best people to do the work. Um, and a lot of people uh, die from being crushed by the debris or falling and like just the impact from hitting the ground and stuff. And the others died from uh, drowning in the river when the, the rescue team couldn't get to them in time. Um, so this is kind of the image of the bridge. It's literally pretty blurry. Can't really see it much, but you know, you can just make out all the metal and debris and stuff that's in the water so the cause for an incident um so the cause of the collapse of the bridge was kind of uh, by the snapping of the cantilever arms with uh with cooper extending the sides of the bridge and increased the weight of the bridge and the engineers uh that were kind of overseeing it uh didn't calculate the the change in weight to, so they didn't increase the weight support of the cantilever arms. Um, they did figure this out though, while in the midst of construction. And, um, but I guess Cooper told them that they didn't need to really take the bridge apart because they done, I mean, kind of already put it mostly together and that the, uh, and that the weight should be good because they didn't kind of want to take the bridge apart and then have to add new supports uh, or make new supports for the extra weight. Uh, so Cooper did calculations himself and found that it was only like a 7%, 7 increase in weight, which he felt like that the cantilever arms could support and would not be fatal. Um, about three months, or not three months, about three weeks later, but three weeks prior to the incident on the 29th, uh, the cantilever arms uh, on the south spawn were uh, found bent. Um, the engineer who found it was actually named Norman uh, McClure, and he reported on August the 6th to Cooper that the arms were, uh, he uh, found initial arm bend in like the, the uh, it was like the A7L um, member. He found a bend in it. Um, and then about uh, six days later on August the 12th, he sent in another um report to Cooper saying that he found two more arm uh, members bend in the AAL and the A9L. Uh, he then sent the third report that uh, on August 27th that they, the bending got even worse in those same supports. Um, and when he sent that final uh, um, report, McClure actually took a train from Quebec to New York to meet with Cooper in person to discuss the uh, the damages of the bridge, I guess, and what he was seeing. Um, so on the 29th, um, I think he left on the 27th and I think he didn't get to New York till the 29th. I didn't really say approximate date when he got to New York, but um, it was said on the 29th that um, Cooper finally like kind of understood the the severity of the bridge and he told McClure to send a message to the Phoenix Bridge Company and also to go to the Phoenix Bridge Company himself uh, or he sent a wire he told McClure to send a wire to the Phoenix Bridge Company and then also go to the Phoenix Bridge Company himself to tell them to stop all operations but by the time um, they received the message and McClure had got there 
the bridge had already like collapsed. Um, so this is just a diagram kind of what kind of happened. So these are the AAL, A9L, I think uh, A7L will be up here a little bit of like the collapse. Um, and then also the bridge kind of collapsed like more in the middle. Um, just like kind of where like the, the truss was at and then the, the bending and you can see all the force and tension kind of like on the outside of the bridge, I guess, not like really in the like middle of it. And then this is just the same thing up top, kind of showing how the tension up top and the compression on the bottom and how the load was kind of like in the middle, pushing down and doing the same thing, just being too heavy right here. And then it finally just snapped. Um, so the aftermath of the incident, uh, so after the incident happened the Canadian government took over the project of the bridge, uh, they rebuilt the bridge with the same designs, but just added much heavier uh, cantilever arms. The bridge then had a second incident in which the new center span collapsed on September 11th, 1916. Uh, didn't really say, and I didn't really look into what caused that incident, that second incident, but I'm assuming probably like the same thing. It was just the middle was just too heavy. So it couldn't, it didn't have enough support. Um, but falling into the river, there was uh, uh, 13 men that died that day. Um, the bridge would eventually be completed in 1917 and the Prince of Wales would officially open it on August 22nd, 1919. I guess he waited the two years just to make sure everything was good and it got tested and stuff to make sure it wouldn't collapse again with uh, public people um, using it. Um, and then after Cooper kind of received most of the criticism and blame for the failure of the initial bridge just because of his negligence and uh, multiple reports of the bridge being defected and, and stuff and nothing being done. Um, this is just kind of images of the second bridge. It's kind of where it collapsed in the middle right here to the water, you can see. And then this is image over here uh, on the right. You can see it's just the bridge after it's built and finished. So now I'm on ethics, so I'm kind of going just to, into the values of, uh, that I've seen. I think Cooper demonstrated horrible values on this project as the lead engineer. He changed major things in the final like uh, decision of the design by like just increasing or decreasing the, uh, the wind load by 26 pounds per square feet, which I guess kind of made the bridge a little flimsy, but then also having like it heavy in the middle and he also like increased the weight load from 16,000 pounds per square inch to 21,000 pounds per square inch for the E30 and 24,000 pounds per square inch for the E50 supports. And I guess that was just too heavy for it to do that. Um, he also received criticism before like uh, construction began from uh, the government, um, from a government engineer. Uh, which enraged him and angered him, and he like ignored it. And a lot, uh, I mean, a lot of reports were said that uh, just because he was he was a, a, I mean, a great engineer at the time, that his like ego was just too high, and he couldn't like, and he never took criticism well. And I guess it kind of like made him mad to like actually be like, all right, I'm gonna prove him wrong by doing it my way, but then his way kind of hurt people by because. I guess just trying to be ignorant and and just and just put other people in danger instead of taking the precautions. I also think like with him changing the changing all that stuff with the like in the final uh, design, I don't think it was bad necessarily, but I think he personally should have did more of the calculations and make sure everything was good and right because he wasn't on site, so he never really got to see like the like the damages that was happening at the beginning like of the like of August. And then, cause he had like an, I guess an engineering team that was there for him on his behalf. They were kind of overlooking it. But uh, I've seen a lot of like stuff saying that these engineers were young and really didn't work on sites like that before and haven't been like the lead people kind of over a site. So it was kind of like, you know, Cooper was like, I think I had Googled it. I think Cooper would have been like almost in his late 60s 
so he's he's been an engineer probably for a long time um so he kind of like know how it goes and stuff which he couldn't put all that pressure on like the young engineers and i think he just like professionalism and negligence of his duty and he also put like time and money over the safety of the workers because he chose like a cheap easy project that should have went fast but not really taking the precautions of make sure everything's safe um I think the morals, Cooper, you know, I mean, I think there was value set by the engineering world to, you know, kind of just make sure everybody's safe, production goes well. The over, like, I think overviewing the site was huge in, like, kind of his blame because he really didn't understand the severity of, like, what was happening. He probably just thought there were, like, minor bends in the bridge when it was more than just minor bends. Um, I think it's just, again, he should have did the calculations himself or at least been with his team while doing the calculations just to make sure, like, everything was good and, and right. I think um, – and then, like, when they did figure out that it was heavier, I think he should have realized that or when he realized that it was heavier than expected – they should have just stopped it and took it apart and added more support or made the support thicker and heavier so they could hold the bridge. Um, I think with his, in the competition, he went with the cheapest and quickest design to build, which is also, I feel like, never a good thing. You never do, you know, cheap and easy, like cheap and quick because you kind of want something that's like in the middle, like that medium happy where it's like, it's like a little expensive, maybe not too expensive. Like you can, like the government could afford it, and it would take some time to build, but you know it would be a strong, sturdy support and stuff like that. Um, and it also just multiple reports being sent to him, because I think his, his team of uh, engineers on site it was like three or four people, three or four engineers. There was like exchange between um four of them saying how like how uh just explaining the problem with some of the bridge and leading up to the event and he's just back and forth with them and they're not making no changes or stopping production or anything like that um i think i mean the engineers on site i think were negligent too because they are there so they are seeing what was happening and how the the members were bending and which they shouldn't have been so i think they could have also could have stopped could have stopped the workers from working and just been like hey y'all don't work the bridge is not safe yet or bridge is not safe anymore or have to come back and re like evaluate it and just the they could have did like a major meeting between the company government and like cooper and his like team of engineers that were there and be like hey bridge is not good gotta take it apart all this stuff but they didn't do that um just the responsibilities i think theodore cooper is to be held like the most responsible for the incident being the head engineer over the whole project, he should have been more attentive and took like the extra precautions and just being there and making sure it's good. I don't, I know he's from New York and he probably had projects in New York too at the time, maybe. So I don't, I'm not saying he should, he had to like live in Quebec the whole time while the project's being built, but he still could have gone, been there for like a few days or check it out, you know, every like once a week, every two weeks go down there for like two, three days, check it out, make sure everything's good, going smoothly, and just make sure. But he did it do that. Um, and then just, just I don't know, just with the changes in the weight and all, and like the size of the bridge, he should have just made sure like, let me, I mean like, if you're like the head engineer, I think you should like also be like, hey, let me review. Even though like he might have to do the calculations, but he should like at least review the calculations from his team and just make sure they're doing their, their your junk right too because they were young engineers that weren't they weren't in the game long so it's like you should also make sure like they're doing their part and make sure that everything is right um i think they on site could be held a little responsible too just because they are there they did see what happened even though they did report it to cooper they could have made the stops and changes there and just like hey let's stop working until we get this figured out just because I mean, they are in Quebec. He's all the way in New York. It's far distance. I mean, he's in the U.S. They're in Canada. So it's like they could have just stopped in the middle. Like, hey, 
let's let's figure this out later or let's not work until we figure this out on why the bridge is bending and all this stuff um i think phoenix race company even though i don't i wouldn't put the blame or responsibility on them but i think i mean they were the initial with the they were the the, the company that won the initial design so i think even though cooper was the lead consultant and engineer they could have been like hey I don't like all these changes you're making or, hey, can we not change so much? Because you know, they are sending out their own people to help construct it and all that stuff. So I think they could have been like, hey, I don't think these changes don't work or like, I don't see like them working and stuff and just helping with making sure everything went smoothly too. And just like, just kind of fighting back a little bit with more with Cooper instead of just like, if he just says something, it goes. Um, I think even though, and then also it was a government project. So I think they kind of should have had somebody overviewing or over it too, not just Cooper. I think they should have had like another person over it, kind of watching Cooper too and make sure he was doing his part because it is, it was government funded. It was a government project. So I think somebody from the government should have been out there at least to just, cause they could have, they definitely would have probably made stops if they seen something going wrong and new people were, um, life was endangered, but I mean, they didn't have nobody out there from what I could find. So that's just like my point of view on it. And then it's not work cited.